All right, good evening, everyone. So yeah, uh, my name's Sam, I'm the co-founder and CTO at Oso. Um, and what we're all about is making security more accessible for developers. That is the, the thing that brought my co-founder and I together uh, almost three years ago now, and the thing that we've been working towards like ever since. And I think a lot of that comes down to tooling. And as David just said in the intro, kind of you know, t looking, at, looking at solving problems in maybe unique ways. And where that led us as a company, and I did not expect this when we started out, was to building our own programming language. Um, we learned a bunch of stuff along the way, and that's, that's what I'd love to share with you tonight. So I'm going to use a, a kind of a little bit of a speaker trick here. Instead of leaving it to you to try and work out what I'm trying to talk about or get you to learn, I'm just going to tell you up front. This isn't really about building programming languages. I'll, I'll touch on that a bit towards the end, um, but really, as you know, as David said, this is about you know looking at a problem, identifying what kind of tools or solutions are available to solving it. Um, now, this might not be something that is necessarily going to be immediately practical that you're going to go away and build your own programming language to solve uh, you know your latest problem at work or something, but it might give you a little bit of insight into some of the design or the craft that's gone into some of the popular libraries or tooling that you use. Um, maybe help you understand what what those developers were trying to were trying to balance and trade off, um, or maybe it's just a you know, interesting story about what we did along the way. OK, so what is this about? So first of all, this is about the problem of authorization. So you may have heard you know, a few terms similar to this, you know, auth, auth n, authentication, auth z, authorization. You know, a lot of these terms get kind of thrown around. So you know, what we're talking about here is authorization. So um, typically, when you talk about sort of securing access to an application, uh, the first thing most people do is authentication. It's this process of identifying you know, who you are you know, enter in your username and password, that kind of thing. That gets you in the front door, and now you're like in the building. You know, what are the things you're allowed to do? What are the things you're allowed to see? This piece is authorization, right? You know, are you allowed to see these particular resources or documents? Can you see your, this data and so on and so on? So that's authorization. Now, a lot of typical authorization logic looks like these kind of like flow chart diagrams. There's lots of branchy nested uh, logic. So. Um, you know, maybe you need to check that somebody has a particular role in an organization or they're the owner of this repository or something and, you know, so on and so on. And um, this kind of like stretches on and on and on. Um, so, you know, the question then becomes well, like, how do I, how do I get this kind of logic and, you know, add it to my application, right? So what I, what I need to get as my end result is that a user interacting with my app uh, is going to get, you know, either right, right access to the right data or, you know, maybe something saying that this is not authorized. Um, and so, you know, this kind of comes down to like how, basically, how can I represent that sort of like nested flowchart of logic? You know, I can do this if this, otherwise if this, and so on and so on. How can I represent that as code? That's the problem that we're all talking about here. That's the problem that um, we had also were trying to solve. And our first attempt to this was, you know, trying to keep this simple and just being like, all right, well, we'll just, we'll build this as a library API, you know? so. You know, a regular you know node package that you can just install and add your app and you you interact with and and that provides all of this kind of like authorization logic um, capabilities to you. And it looks something like this. Um, if you stare at this for long enough, you might realize that this is actually just regular Python code, but it really doesn't look like it. Uh, and the reason for that is, you know, we're we're trying to represent these kind of logical structures, conditional statements, and and like logical rules using you know, standard Python objects. And, and so what that kind of ended up meaning is that we were just like very much like forcing the shape of the, you know, the problem we had into the things we had available to us, which is like methods and classes and things like that. So this one, this example is probably a little bit like abstract and hard to understand, but I, I expect most of you are probably uh, familiar with, maybe have heard of or used ORMs in the past. Um, so if you look at, there's a you know, popular JavaScript ORM called SQLize. And it has this kind of this kind of uh, code that I'm showing on the screen here for representing SQL queries, and this is like a very similar example, right? Like a SQL query, it's like a declarative statement of how you can you know access particular data, and so to represent that in like regular JavaScript, you know they do these through these kind of like nested um, nested maps and dictionaries and objects, things like that. But it doesn't really look that much like JavaScript. It's got a bunch of these these patterns you might not like normally encounter, where you know you have this thing that looks like maybe an array square brackets with op.or. Um, and there's really kind of a lot to learn. And, and a lot of this comes from this kind of like trying to match some existing structure of like SQL into um, your kind of like application code. Um, I should actually say though, I'm 
you know, actually a big fan of ORMs. I think they're, they're fantastic tools. I just think it's a really interesting comparison. And so basically like taking this approach, um, you know, with the library API to this kind of a problem uh, has some good and bad. You know, the good is that you're using syntax and tooling you already have, right? So you are just interacting with regular JavaScript classes, things like that. So, you know, if you're in your IDE and you hover over the object, you're going to get like nice doc strings, you can get all that kind of stuff. And you have the full power of JavaScript. Like if you need to write a, uh, I don't know, you, you have a bunch of inputs, you need to loop over them and map them, like you just write that in JavaScript, pass it through to the, through to the library to do, to do what it needs to afterwards. On the other hand, if you have a reasonably complex domain that you're trying to represent in that in that language, you potentially end up with this like large API service area, which is you know where you know, see all like the different SQL operators um, are under this like opt or uh, kind of thing. And finally, it varies by language. So you you know maybe you've gone and spent a lot of time with SQLize and you've become proficient in that. You then move to a different company and uses a different um, programming language. A lot of that knowledge might just be gone. It's it's not going to be it's not going to help you go and implement something in in say Python with like a SQL Alchemy RM. And for us at Oso, that was like really important. This was a big a big piece of what we were trying to do was provide like a consistent experience for authorization across multiple languages. Okay, so the second thing we tried was doing this as configuration. And so what I mean by that is you know maybe representing this like authorization logic in something like JSON. Um, and so kind of we came up with this. You know, we, we, we sort of define the various fields in JSON and so on and so on and kind of structured it. And, you know, it's it's quite verbose and I say it's not, you know, the nicest thing to read. Um, and again, I think there's like pretty common patterns of people taking this sort of approach uh, like out in the wild. So this is very, very common in things like CI. So if you look at GitHub Actions, the configuration there is all written in, in YAML. But within the YAML, you have things like these if statements where Really, you've, you've, they've, they've extended YAML and they've added things like expressions. So you can do, you know, you have there's like some va variables coming from somewhere. You can compare them to strings. You can do things like that, which, you know, you're no longer really in YAML. You're in like this YAML plus. And the, the plus is all something that you as a developer need to like learn to be able to understand how to use, you know, GitHub Actions. So again, you get some good and bad. Um, using something like JSON or YAML, like, similarly to like a known language, you know, this you know, there's a wide ecosystem of tooling for, for JSON and YAML. Your you know coders will have highlighting for it and um, things like that. It, you know people already know how it works. Um, and now we do have something that's cross language, right? Like most languages support yeah JSON and YAML in some form or have a good library to do it. So it's it's pretty easy to use these in you know inside your your library and and, and so on. So um, and in particular, right, it's you know these formats are very easily manipulated by machines. So if you want to do some uh, you know, automation or you know, code generation maybe and generate a lot of these things, that can be super easy. On the other hand, these are configuration formats. They're not necessarily you, um, you know, supposed to represent rich concepts like authorization or querying data or CI jobs and you know, conditional workflows. So you end up having to like add your own functionality to them. Um, and that's you know, and that often comes in the form of custom extensions. Sometimes you see things like templating, where um, if you're familiar with uh, like Helm charts for in like the Kubernetes world, where it's like YAML but with you know a whole additional syntax for how you can like generate them to do like things like loops. Um, they're not really designed for humans, especially not things like JSON. It's supposed to be a you know a, a data format that is sent between machines, not necessarily for humans. So it can be pretty verbose and hard to read. And they all have their idiosyncrasies. So, you know, JSON doesn't out of the box support have like comments. So you can't really comment your JSON if you're just doing standard JSON. YAML has things like white space bugs or the kind of infamous typecasting where if you, you know, the country code Norway gets converted to a Boolean, you know, things like that. Um, so you might be wrestling with these and depending on the problem you're trying to solve, these can be pretty, you know, pretty hard things to deal with. So the final thing we kind of like hit upon and reached, uh, which was kind of the work of one of the engineers is sort of a, a like a little weekend exercise was to try logic programming. And so logic programming is this, is this kind of alternative area of programming languages. So you're probably used to uh, imperative programming, you know, things like JavaScript where you write the code and it kind of goes through and executes. Uh, in comparison, logic programming is uh, more declarative and it doesn't, it doesn't follow that like linear thro flow through the code. Um, it normally has some sort of like an evaluation engine that will like run a kind of like a search query through it. But this is like a, you know, this is, 
as, a, as an error, it actually matches up very nicely with authorization. Um, so we went and tried to implement something for that. And here's a snippet from one of the early prototypes, which my eye is honestly glazing over just trying to look at this screen. It was not very nice to read. And you know, coming back to the mission of OSO, right? We're trying to make uh, security a bit more accessible for developers. This did not do it. But this was this was basically was like V1. This was like based off of existing logic programming called Prolog, you know, with a few of our own kind of like tweaks to it. But given that we're building our own language, we now sort of have all the flexibility that we at our fingertips we want to 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 choose how this should look. So we went through numerous iterations. We spoke with a bunch of developers. We asked them to do things and see if it made sense to them or not. Uh, and so in the end, you know, today it looks something more like this. Uh, and so you know, this here is like an authorization rule. It says you know allow a user to read. Uh, a repo, which is a, of type repository. They're allowed to do that if the user has a role in the repo and that role is allowed to read the repo. So it's actually come, becomes pretty concise. And it's, it's, it's like very cleanly now expressing some of this like branching logic. Like first I check the users in a role and then I check the roles allowed to do things. Um, and and it, it kind of fits the paradigm really nicely. And uh, you know, this isn't a, this isn't so much about like Polar and design of the language for this, but um, we have like numerous examples showing just like how concisely you can write expresses authorization logic through this. And so again, we have good and bad, right? So as I was just saying, right, you can, if you're building your own language, you can really design it specifically for the use case. What are the things you need to do? You know, for authorization, we wanted it to, you know, have semantics for application data. So you could just like read attributes off of your data structures and compare them to other ones. You can, you know, represent Boolean conditional logic very, very easily and, and kind of on and on, on. Like you, you need that functionality, you build the language to, to do it. Um, again, though, you know, there is you know, decades of work on not just Prolog, which is uh, you know, logic programming language, but just you know, programming language design in general to, to, to build on. So it's not like an entirely unscoped problem. Um, you know, for, and, um, you know, for example, I'm personally like a, a big fan of Rust. And one of the things that people often say about Rust is that it's not really doing anything new. It's just taking a lot of old research and putting it into one language. So you can kind of do some of that. And finally, it also meets that criteria that we really wanted that is language agnostic. So we have the, you know, the polar language, something that you can express your authorization logic in. And I'll talk about this in a, in a bit uh, soon, but you can use this across any language, right? So whether you're in Python or JavaScript or, or Ruby, like you have the same uh, like interface to work with. Now, there are some downsides, right? So in creating our new language, we have now created a learning curve for people. We have created something that everyone's going to have to learn if they want to be able to use, you know, use the OSO product and um, to write polar authorization logic. Um, they now need to learn this language, and you know, you can kind of mitigate this. Like as I, as I showed in the example, you know, we had a very very user unfriendly experience. We try to make it better, so you, you know, you can try and keep the learning curve. Uh, I never know which one it is, shallow or steep, but you know, the one where people get to learn stuff pretty quickly. But it has to be said, you know, there is there is a learning curve. You are asking someone to learn something new. Um, and like in the case of Polar, it's a logic programming language. So it's a kind of a, a new paradigm. It's It's got like a, a bunch of learning things from, from that. And, you know, the other part is that uh, there is no existing tooling for this. Everything that we want from a developer experience standpoint, we need to be building this ourselves or rely on the goodness of our community. Um, so, you know, we we early on built a you know, syntax high team for VS Code, for example, but um, there are other editors that don't, don't yet have that. We've had to build our own debugger and our own REPL so you can interact with the language um, because these are tools, I think, as a developer, we're very much accustomed to having. Um, and so this can end up being like a lot of additional work, right? You're effectively, you know, you, you're trying to create this you know, developer experience that, other, that most people would get just by nature of using the well-established language. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a kind of a case of like balance all of these pros and cons carefully. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about um, what it actually took for us to go ahead and build Polar, the, the language, and, and build the products on top of it, and, and so on, because I think it's a, a kind of an interesting piece. Like the, the next step on, it's like, OK, cool, here are some trade-offs about design, but um, then what happens, right? What comes next? So the sort of bottom of all of this is, or the top in this diagram is going to be, is Polar Core. So this is the core language, the implementation of the language, which we wrote in Rust. Uh, and we did this very intentionally for a number of reasons, which included being able to embed this in other languages. And one, because I'm a you know, fan of the language, but also you know, for security sensitive applications, it's got some nice like uh, memory safety guarantees, things like that. And so this is like the one, this is the piece one, you know, 
the you know one giant piece of the implementation is the Boda language, and we get to do that once, and we get to do it in Rust. Uh, we then have a C style API. So this is like a very common way to embed in multiple languages is um, through exposing some form of C API. And we, uh, you know, compile the Polar Rust core into a library and then you know, link it into other languages. Um, but we also have a WASM API. And this is actually how we're supporting uh, both Node, but also like browser JavaScript um, is through using this Polar WASM API. Uh, so this is this, um, I probably won't go try and go into WebAssembly too much because I don't think I can do it justice, but it's a kind of a new, I'd say very exciting area um, for this kind of like interrupt language that runs you know, in JavaScript. And it's particularly, you know, it's a compile target for Rust code, for example. So it takes the entire Rust code that normally you would like build into a you know, system library, a static library, that kind of thing, and gets compiled effectively into JavaScript, um, which is amazing. And there's like multiple, uh, multiple languages that can target uh, the WASM is the output format. There's also multiple languages that can use WASM, not just JavaScript. So you can also Im embed like a WASM runtime in your Go code and, and call it that way. Uh, so this is kind of like a really nice alternative way of um, making this like core Rust code exposed to, to a number of different uh, languages. And so in particular, um, you know, this is the current state of things today. This is like a little snippet from our from our doc site uh, of like the languages you can choose, and these are all built on top of those two core APIs, all built on top of that one in a language um, implementation. And so this is kind of you know, this is kind of the the, the point I was getting at, at the beginning is you know, to support all these languages. A lot of our hard work has gone into the the language, and in, in exchange, we get to support uh, things from you know all the way from I don't know Java to to Node and Go and things like that. It's come to the cost. There is a price for this. Um, we, you know, it, we had simplified some things, but this is a this is a little screenshot from our uh, GitHub Actions build job. Because um, basically, you know, we have to compile that Rust code. We compile it across multiple different operating systems, and then we need to build all these separate libraries on top of this and test that all those work and potentially test those across different versions of different libraries. So, um, it's definitely no such thing as you know a, a free lunch in this case. It's um, Still a lot of work that needs to go into actually actually package this, but then you know again the nice thing is like the vast majority of the code is all happening in that in a Rust piece, and the other stuff kind of all uh, extrapolates from there. Okay, so some of the things, some okay, some of the additional points that I want you to take away, other than the ones I called out at the beginning, uh, I think there's often a quite a bit of a uh, and hesitation or fear around, you know, people call like DSLs, stands for domain specific language, um, which I think is kind of, it's understandable because as I said, you know, new languages, things like that, they do incur a learning curve. You maybe don't have all the right tooling for them. But one of the things like we, I, I feel like I learned through this process is that like sometimes a library API or a YAML file can really be a, a DSL in disguise, right? Like if you have to, go through all the documentation and learn like what are all the different uh, you know operators that the library exposes and supports and how do I combine them and what are the various combinations of methods I need to call to do this thing or what's the expressions that give action support this is at this point you're, you're basically learning a, a DSL and and you might be you know working with a DSL which has even worse support than a custom built one right like you have expressions in github that you can't you can't debug you can't you don't, you don't get any syntax highlighting of that GitHub Actions expression um, that I know of, at least. Um, and the final parting thought I, I, I wanted to share, um, building a language is fun. It's it's a ton of fun. Um, don't, be, don't be too scared or put off by the crazy CI build chain. Um, it's, I think it's worth it. That's basically what I want to say. So thank you very much to everyone for listening. Uh, just going to leave some, some links up here if you want to learn more about uh, also, what we're about, uh, I should have said, actually, everything I've been speaking about tonight is part of our open source library. So all of the code for this is available uh, on GitHub. You can see just how all those things are working. Um, we're also you know, having this, we have this growing uh, community around the open source stuff, which you can join through our, the Slack link here. Um, but I'm you know, more than happy to ask anything you know, here, Rambly, or on Twitter, or wherever. <laughs>